Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, it's 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 a pleasure to be here. I I've have an engineering background, and I get less opportunities to talk to to uh, to people that are deep in engineering as I'd like to. So thanks for having me. Uh, and happy Juneteenth. Um, I've got a lot of stuff to cover, and hopefully, including a you know a call to action that I'd like to try to get across to everybody. So let me give you an an outline of what I want to talk about here. The first is what I think this kind of metaverse dream that we're all talking about is really about. And then how my own, you know, almost 20 year experience now with Second Life fits into the history of that metaverse idea. Then I want to talk about what the barriers to broader adoption of this, of these technologies are, or at least what I think they are. Uh, I also want to defend why it makes sense to try to do it. Why does it? Why is it actually a good thing to try and get uh, such broader usage? And then finally, uh, you know, I want to get to the, the meat of what I think this conference is about, which is how how I can suggest or how I think computer vision may be part of a, a kind of a moonshot to make that happen. So let's let's dive in. Um, you know, first, I would just say that history is full of cases where, you know, we repurposed technology that was intended for some other use instead to serve for social communication, for some kind of communication. I, I would think a, a really old example would actually be smoke signals with fire. Um, and, you know, we can all imagine that the original kind of will you marry me sent as Morse code or something like that with a, a smoke signal is probably... Uh, lost to time at this point. So uh, that's an old example. But you know, this summer, I, I've been reading a book uh, and really enjoying it called The Friendly Orange Glow. I, I imagine some people here may remember this system that was called Plato. Um, and believe it or not, Plato was a pretty complete version of the internet as we know it today. But the work started in 1959. And it became widely used in the early 1970s around the University of Illinois. And uh, thousands of people, <laughs> believe it or not, in the early 1970s were connecting uh, to mainframe computers via phone lines and using terminals that were, were basically a, a, a keyboard attached to a very early prototype of a plasma screen display. Fantastic and amazing. Um, now that service, Plato, started off as a teaching tool where you programmed lessons that students could then work through online. That was the original idea. But... Of course, rapidly, it became something more like what we have today with Slack and Twitter and Reddit, you know, with people mostly using it to meet each other and communicate and, and play with each other um, than use it for teaching. In fact, I just found a great online quote this morning. It said, after programmer Doug Brown gave Plato users the ability to talk to one another on a split screen, which he called Talkomatic, uh, system use skyrocketed. It was more like a virtual water cooler than a telephone substitute. So, you know, I think the reason for this is that we are intensely social animals and we rely on communication both for our safety and also our collaboration. And so whenever we find a way, typically with new technology, to open new communication channels between ourselves, we immediately do it. And so shifting over to the, the idea of the metaverse, and by the way, I don't, I don't think anybody really knows what that word means. I bet Neil Stevenson doesn't even you know, couldn't at this point claim to have the most accurate assessment of the word, though he himself, you know, invented it or used it in, in, in his novel Snow Crash. Um, but I think that the metaverse is this same kind of repurposing of technology for communication. You know, at, at its core, I think, is the idea or the hope that we might be able to reuse the internet as we know it today to instead create a kind of live public commons. You know, Web 1.0 was mostly, right, it was mostly about broadcasting static information, you know, via web servers about, say, your business or a group of people or whatever, but it was broadcasting static information. Um, but increasingly over time, just like Plato before, 20 years before it, 
the packets on the internet have become more and more used for different types of communication. And so I think broadly the metaverse idea is that. In fact, when people talk about the metaverse, I think they sometimes mix together two things that we both know, but I think they're somewhat different. One is the transition from two dimensions to three dimensions, the idea that we could, you know, reuse, we, we could move the internet from largely two-dimensional web pages to some sort of three-dimensional spaces. And of course, as many people here probably could talk about more than I, there's lots of good reasons why that's true. There's going to be lots of cases where 3D does make a lot of sense. But as I said before, I think the more important and separable idea and transition is this idea of going from being, the, the internet going from being a kind of single-player experience where you're alone to a public commons. I mean, imagine when you browse some popular website, right? There are actually thousands of people that are at that website, perhaps reading the very same sentence as you at the very same moment, and yet you can't see them. So imagine if you could turn to your left or your right and actually, one, see in some meaningful way the other people that were at that website with you, and then uh, maybe uh, be able to actually speak to them. So I think that's the real promise of the metaverse creating that public commons and it's also of course the very real potential peril of it if we uh, do it wrong so similarly um second life went through a kind of transformation i started the company in 1999 and my original vision since i was a kid was that of a kind of a place and a sandbox i wanted to build a simulated world that basically combined two things. One was some kind of laws of physics, you know, that would be deterministic and would, you know, you, you would know how you could build, manipulate things in there. And then an economy to allow people to engage in trade of the things that they created. So that was really the original vision for Second Life. But there again, it rapidly be, became used more for communication between people. Um, by the way, at the beginning, I didn't even know what avatars should be. Our original avatars were a giant, like, uh, we made this funny, like, flaming eyeball that that looked, you know, in the direction that the view frustum was oriented for the client. Um, and I didn't know what more we would need. But people immediately started communicating with each other there. For example, showing them, showing each other the programming work that they were doing because we had a programming language from the beginning. Uh, or trying to find people to date or trying to uh, find ways to work together to make money. Um, and soon the feature set of Second Life was also driven largely by this challenge of enhancing communication. Like as soon as people could build 3D objects in the world, they wanted to build something like a pair of glasses and attach them uh, to their avatar. And so um, I can say with great confidence that if we hadn't had uh, the rich ability to communicate that we did in Second Life, as well as very rich and detailed avatars, which I think factors into the conversation here, very uh, richly detailed avatars, we would never have reached the scale that Second Life has reached today, which, which is uh, about a million people participating in a world where when they log on, they spend about four hours at a time, and um, an economy that is about $650 million a year with a typical transaction of about $2. So a very large amount of um, economic activity happening between the, these, this, this million people living in a kind of city. Um, but moving on, there's a huge problem we face, a huge chasm to cross with this metaverse thing. The three largest social virtual worlds, if you will, that we're talking about today, the, the, those that have significant size and are much larger, in fact, than Second Life, are all ones whose names we know, and they're the ones generating all the press, Roblox, Minecraft, Fortnite. Those are the big three. Now, what they all have in common is this big problem. They're used entirely and only by kids. So almost 100% of the usage there is kids. And in fact, it's kids that range between about 7 and 14 years old. So why is that? Why aren't there any grown-ups there yet? Um, after years of working at Second Life and, and then for the last 10 years at High Fidelity doing experiments, I, I would submit that the reason this is is because only kids thus far are actually willing to communicate in social spaces, particularly with strangers, as avatars. Um, Grown-up people, um, even late teenagers, for example, are just not comfortable doing it. Uh, I, I would say right now that more than 90% of people are fundamentally uncomfortable being portrayed as an avatar, whether, whether wearing VR goggles or not. You know, as an aside, 
I hear a lot of people say that that only older people are uncomfortable as avatars, but as a person with four teenage kids, my data would suggest the opposite. Um, I actually think that Generation Z kids crave authenticity even more than older people do and are less likely to use avatars. They demand audio or unaltered video, say FaceTime in their communications. Um, kids do use filters and avatars, but not for live communication. They use them for things like TikTok uh, or Instagram posts. So avatars somehow need to be improved enough that they're appealing uh, to adults. But you know, before jumping into why, um, how I think we might be able to do that, let me just defend that I actually do think that getting adults to be able to communicate online in virtual worlds is a worthy goal. And that's certainly an appropriate question or you know, position to defend right now because we're in this moment where many of the existing um, social media services um, and broadcast services that we see on the internet are making some of us, I think, think that communication or tech, that, that technology and online communication is inherently harmful uh, and divisive, and that isn't true. Uh, technology by itself is neutral in its impact, and remarkably, Second Life stands out as a proof of that possibility. Um, for 20 years now, literally kind of alongside the same timeline as, say, Facebook that started about when we did, Second Life has been an incredibly positive um, and in many cases actually transformative experience for the people that are there. Now, it's not as many people as, say, the Internet, but it is a very diverse group of people from all over the world and equal gender balance um, uh, ac across many different age groups. And so Second Life stands out as at least an example of why one might be able to why, might want to try to create a virtual public commons. Um, it, Without touching on why Second Life is different, I could just say that with social media that we have today, there's a couple of big reasons why we end up with this negative outcome. Um, one is at relying, on, relying on advertising as a business model. Systems that use advertising have to compete for your attention and maximize your viewing time. And they do that, unfortunately, um, by presenting you with polarizing and divisive content because that's what makes you watch the most. And in many cases, that content is maximized by surveillance data that's collected about you. We have to not do that as we move into the metaverse. We can't use that business model because we've already seen how negative its impact can be. An additional problem is that anonymous or asynchronous services where people have no social consequences for their negative actions encourage toxic behavior. But this is very different than the real world. And there's absolutely no reason why we can't create the same kind of social contract in online spaces as we have in the real world. Um, so let me now talk a little bit about how uh, we might use computer vision and sort of what the problem is. I think an objective kind of a litmus test for success around what we need to do here is whether or not you'd recognize an avatar that you saw as someone you knew from only their nonverbal expressions. If you turn off the audio with their facial gestures, hand and body movements, um, let you know me, let you know who they were if you already knew them. There's been a lot of great progress in the last few years such as the work we've done for a decade at High Fidelity, but I think that none of the present um, head-mounted display-based worlds, avatar worlds, such as VR chat or Facebook Horizons, would pass this test. I don't think in any of them you'd be able to say, pick out your teacher um, from a virtual lineup from only their movements. And so I think that idea of only nonverbal cues conveying identity is a great lit litmus test. So, and, um, Dwelling for a moment uh, just specifically on HMDs and why I think computer vision is a better direction to go, um, I think the roadblocks to broad, inclusive adoption of the HMD are enormous. Um, when we gave up, we, we gave up at High Fidelity working on HMDs on realizing what the how how difficult it was going to get to widespread social inclusive adoption for people. There are the easy problems like weight and acuity and taking phone calls or being able to take notes with HMDs on. But I think the harder uh, and more insidious problems are actually related to inclusion in, in two ways. One is if we're gonna change social behavior or improve the world through these devices, everybody in the world needs to have access to them uh, at the same in, in the same way we have access to smartphones. And I think it's gonna be very, very difficult to uh, to, to do that with devices like HMDs. Um, the second and, and the most subtle problem that we really noticed at Second Life is that people are the people who are more marginalized than others are the ones that feel least safe wearing HMDs. There is a kind of a subtle discomfort that I think arises from a lack of safety that you feel when you're blindfolded, potentially in a room full of people with one of these devices. And unfortunately, that causes 
uh, that skews the inclusion factors for who's willing to use these devices. And I think that one is kind of a showstopper until we get around it. Um, so let's take a look at how without HMDs, we might create these broad social worlds. One study that's interesting is spatial audio, which we worked on for a decade at High Fidelity. Um, and, and spatial audio as applied to communication is the goal of allowing many people to speak at the same time, um, which is vital. Uh, we perfected it, I mean, at High Fidelity. Uh, imagine being in a cocktail party or, or say a, a mixer for this conference and just being in the room with everybody else and then closing your eyes. But, you know, wearing headphones, you have exactly the same uh, audio experience as you did there. That's the uh, level that I think we got to with High Fidelity. But what we found was that it's still not good enough, uh, for example, for a bunch of strangers, say, at a conference like this to meet each other. So audio alone, even if it's absolutely perfect, basically just you with your eyes closed, is not good enough to make people comfortable uh, participating. So then what, what do we need? And at a high level, nonverbal communication, the other stuff, the stuff other than the audio is I think what we need. So let, let, me, let me talk about, you know, finally here are some, some points that I think start to get into immediately where we can use computer vision. Um, one example of a critical nonverbal signal uh, that has defied uh, capture with an HMD is, is, is leaning in, like I'm doing right now. I'm leaning in and I'm leaning back. We lean forward to indicate engagement, interest, that, that we're comfortable, uh, that, that we're listening. And it's not the same thing as stepping forward or like rolling in your chair. Leaning forward is a really important signal. And of course, the HMD doesn't know where your hips are. And so you can't convey the lean of the torso uh, through an HMD. We could fix it with uh, motion trackers. But again, you get back to that ridiculous, you know, you can't set up all that stuff on your body. Um, so this is something that potentially could be done. Uh, I think by the work that everybody here is doing. And, and similar to that, you know, not even looking at the face or the head is the angle of your shoulders compared to your head pose. When you're standing and talking to somebody, say in a circle, you use your shoulders to admit a new person when you're ready for them to approach. So you actually kind of open the circle to let them in. That's another example of something that we just can't capture with HMDs, but I think we could capture with cameras. Similarly, uh, hand and finger motions. One of the best things is, that has happened recently with the HMD, uh, with say the Oculus Quest, has been the use of not, not having to use hand controllers. Um, as I know from years of experience, trying to talk to people like I am right now to you while holding hand controllers is incredibly hard. It shows you that there's a kind of a wiring between our hand motions and our communication that not only is necessary as a means of conveying what we're saying, but also important even to ourselves to help us to speak. Um, I think it's one of the reasons that VR seems uh, fatiguing. Um, so, and then obviously the facial information, that which we've uh, seen many, many examples of so far with things like, you know, say Facebook Horizons, the facial information has to be good enough not to be amusing or, you know, roughly approximate, you know, roughly appropriate for what's being done or even uh, you know, a button that you hit, say, to make your avatar smile, it needs to be good enough to pass that lit litmus test that I said before, which is an easy one. Knowing somebody that you've met a couple of times immediately from their nonverbal cues on the avatar. And of course, to get to that milestone, we have to do uh, the same thing for the face. So um, face, body, fingers, um, it does seem possible it seems possible that we could use advances in computer vision uh, and, and I guess machine learning to, to really accurately track, you know, enough of this information to convey that to everybody. And as I hope I've explained, you know, as quickly as I can here, um, it's potentially a moonshot. Uh, you know, we face a moment in human history where we have tremendous risk from if and whether we reduce the quality of communication with people at a distance. Um, instead, by, you know, I think using computer vision, you know, rather than expensive and inaccessible devices, we could potentially uh, get there. We could potentially, you know, as I said before, get grownups into public commons that are mediated by online communication uh, and by doing that, change the world. Um, it's something that's motivated me more and more uh, in, the, in the past years, and I hope that it can be done. Uh, I guess you can tell me, um, and I'd love to see uh, more work being done on that. So uh, with that, thank you very much. I don't know whether we have uh, time for questions or turn it, turn it back over to you.